It's over 9,000! Welcome, Super Elite Warriors, to Final Forum, a podcast for the discussion of all things Dragon Ball. I am your host, Jelly, an elite recruiting member of the Frieza Force on a mission to find the best warriors from across the galaxy to join the greatest army of all time, and I am joined, as always, by my new recruit co-host. This is the bikini, and I gotta ask, what the heck? What? Why are we doing one of these now? Normally you'd have me do like a podcast episode while you rushed to the Underground Caverns as Eddie 3. Uh, and then there was another where we were leaving, another on P32, and yet another on Cygnus 5, at least. But you're doing one now as we're leaving Cygnus 5 and with yet another unsuccessful mission and yet another death of mine at the hands of the planet's nightmare creatures. Uh, Giant Beetles, I think it was in this case. And it feels like you skipped out on a bunch of inappropriately timed podcasting. I don't think I like what you're implying here. And what would it be that I'm implying? Well, for starters, that I purposely time our podcast episodes to happen whenever they're least convenient. Wait, you don't think you do that? Oh, no, I definitely do, but I don't like you implying it. (sighs) Second of all, that you think our listeners would be interested in hearing all of those things. What's new or interesting about me going into an underground cavern, finding you among a heap of gruesome remains, you having no idea what happened, me chastising you for lacking awareness, and then us regrouping to leave the planet? What's new or interesting about us floating through space, idly wasting our time on our way to a new planet? Hmm. Point taken, but still. I also don't think I like the implication that whomever writes this show got a little lost in the weeds, poorly planned out this season's timings, and now we're rushing towards a finale because this is when it's going to be most convenient for that to happen. Writer? Season? What are you talking about? Like, whatever it is, I I wasn't implying any of that. Oh, um... Well, uh, disregard that bit, listeners, and instead regard me as I bring you back up to speed on what has taken place since we last spoke. Didn't I do that already? I got eaten by beetles on Cygnus 5, and now we're on our way to that uncharted planet where there are now five warriors gathered. Hmm, that's an overly succinct summary. Tell you what, while I decide if it's sufficient for our listeners, let's dive into this week's topic of discussion. And this week, we are going to put a bow on the 22nd Budokai Tenkaichi we are gonna talk about the final episode which I don't remember what it's called anymore it's called episode 101 titled The Fallen and then we are going to do what we always do and take a look at the manga um, I have my my viz big here as I always do and pleased to report this time <laughs> You know, I always I feel like I always mention this, but, uh, you, you know, I like to. <laughs> that this time it's all in it, uh, Viz Big Volume 4, or however you would call it, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's number four out of the five Dragon Ball Viz Big editions. All of this arc is in Volume 4, which is actually three volumes in one. Because as we've... We've, I'm sure we've mentioned in the past, they take, like, there's a weekly chapter that's released in Shonen Jump. Then they take, is it like 10 of those at a time? 
I think so, yes. They take 10 of those at a time and put those in a volume. And then Viz Media, quite separately, put three of those in one of their Viz Bigs, as they call them. So, episode 101, titled The Fallen, like I said before. Uh, we're going to open with a quick recap of the ring getting absolutely atomized by the Kikoho. But did it atomize Goku? My guess is no, but where is he? Why, he's up in the air, of course. Obviously at a disadvantage here against Tien, and he's hurtling towards the ground, so he decides to go for a final attack using all of his strength. A tried and true Kamehameha. Fired in the opposite direction. Yes, Goku knows Tien can't dodge a Kamehameha rocket-propelled mini Saiyan, so his plan's to hit him hard enough to knock him to the ground first. It's a bold strategy, and Goku slams into Tien, and both are sent rocketing away from the tournament grounds. In a display of supreme professionalism, Mr. Announcer hops on a capsule plane to continue his play-by-play. As he catches up, we see that despite his strategy working, Goku's still closer to the ground. He then alters his trajectory with the very last bit of his energy, a final little baby Kamehameha. He does, uh, it manages to slow him down enough, and now he's fully at the mercy of Sir Isaac Newton. Now, our superior alien societies figured this out way before Newton, but the joke doesn't really work without intimate knowledge of our homeworld, so pandering to humans here. <laughs> it looks like Goku's about to coast to his first championship victory, except for one problem, traffic. Goku bounces off a Volkswagen van and hits the ground before Tien. What an absolute turn of luck against our hero. The crowd beelines from the stadium to celebrate both fighters, and Roshi is pleased with the outcome, confident this experience will result in a major change for Tien. Tien offers half of the prize money, Goku declines, and then the rest of the comic crew offer to bring Tien and Chaozu into the fold. Tien declines that offer as well. I guess they're more loner types. But uh, everyone settles on getting dinner together instead, and the scene closes on a long close-up of Krillin. Hmm, wonder why they did that. They get to the restaurant, and Goku realizes he forgot his Dragon Ball and staff at the arena. Krillin offers to go back and pick them up since Goku just had a tough fight, and he probably is, you know, pretty hungry. Everyone watches as he runs down the street. I'm, I'm sure he's going to be fine. But then Goku gets a terrible premonition that Krillin is in trouble. He rushes back to the arena to find Krillin has been murdered and the Dragon Ball is missing. Mr. Announcer is also injured, and his dedication to professionalism gives Goku the instant replay. Some monster swooped in, beat up Krillin, then ran off with a tournament roster and Grandpa Gohan's Dragon Ball. So much happens in this episode. Quite a bit. <laughs> I don't know for sure. I probably should have looked this up before we we started. If there was a break in anything at all, I would say more so on the manga or on the anime side of things. If there was a break in the anime at all between episode 101 and 102 even a few weeks because that that cliffhanger ending cliffhanger then. ending is honestly one of the most shocking moments if you don't know that it's coming yeah and and, and especially if like the original audience you don't know about all the craziness that can happen with the the dragon balls going down the road I mean, right. we've seen we've seen one person get wished back, right? So obviously that's that's what everyone's going to be thinking. But uh, I don't think it's going to be quite so simple. Just you know, going out and collecting the balls like last time. So this episode aired in Japan, February seventeenth, nineteen eighty-eight, and the next episode aired February twenty-fourth. So there was not a break. In the U.S., there was. There was decidedly <laughs> quite a large. Oh yeah break december 31st 2002 until september 1st 2003 i'll say an unfortunate i guess issue with that being dragon ball as a whole aired after dragon ball z already ran <laughs> so the drama of of that cliffhanger mm -hmm. is 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 muted quite a bit by that <laughs> but so still i think for for those people watching the anime in japan in the 80s for the first time even that week between seeing krillin die and seeing everything else had to be like to me that feels like that'd be like especially as a kid because mostly kids were probably watching this 
you'd be like on on like pins and needles for that next episode. Yeah. That happens. Also, do we have can can we talk about the physics of the ending of this of this battle because I don't think it <laughs> I <laughs> so, I think some artistic liberties were taken with um Sir Isaac Newton's theories here. If you hit a car, doesn't that slow you down? You would think. So wouldn't you hit the ground after Tien, especially since you were above him in the first place? So this is where it gets confusing for me because <laughs> it's not – this part's not necessarily about the physics for me. For me, it's it's what are the exact rules of – ring out for this tournament because it it seems kind of hazy i thought it was if they touched anything outside the ring but am i mistaken is it just supposed to be if they touch the ground outside the ring it's the ground okay that makes a couple other things that have happened then make a little bit more sense to me because the other thing i was thinking about with this whole tournament was there's been instances where uh like in the prelims i think goku jumps off the ceiling and yes. then there's instances where, like, he grabs – well, like in the last episode, he grabbed uh, Master Roshi's sunglasses. Yes, implying he would have had to leave the ring to do so. Yeah, so it's like, okay, so what are exactly the rules here? I, that's that's where – now, I am simply assuming that based on everything we've seen in both tournaments to this point, you have to touch the ground. Okay, that's a fair assumption, and that makes, like I said, that makes a couple other things make more sense then. And I think there's even a thing now. This th- I could be wrong, so if I'm wrong, mark this down. Whatever episode this is, if this didn't happen, this is a um, Mandela Mandela effect. I think in the next tournament, there's a moment where Goku ring outs, kind of. But he lands on a chunk of the ring that has been blown off. And so technically, he's not off the ring. It's been a while since I've seen the next the next tournament, so I'm not sure. That does sound like something that would happen, but I can't place it. We're going to have to keep our eyes on all the tournaments. Either that never happened at all. <laughs> Or and maybe I'm it happened making in a it up tournament. completely, or it happened somewhere, and I'm just misremembering which one it happened in. But to get back to your physics question, <laughs> which 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 what started us down this rabbit hole? Yeah, I can't think of too many instances where, because if you think about the, and this is this is going to show probably a little bit of our background here, but if when he hits the van, right? So the suspension and everything is going to absorb some of that energy. So there's going to be a little bit of recoil, but he's going to be going slower, like you said, right? And Tien is going full tilt into the ground. So, yeah, I agree with you from that perspective. This is a little fuzzy on the math there. <laughs> yeah, this this car, he doesn't just bounce off of this car. This car, like, actively spikes him down. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it almost it almost would work, like, almost better if, like, I don't know, there was, like, like big dude or, like, a, like a dinosaur because dra- dra- the dragon world has dinosaurs yeah. in it. If there was like a dragon or a dragon, a dinosaur like walking around and it saw him coming and like swatted him away. That would be pretty funny. So that you could say it added momentum into onto him. That's that's a possibility. Sure. What if he did it the opposite way where TN hits the van first and that's what saves him from hitting the ground before Goku? See, there you go. Just have And then we would get further clarification that it isn't like cuz Mr. Announcer would have to to explain to folks because it would be reasonable for anybody in the crowd to go wait a minute he hit the car first does that mean it's a ring out and the mr announcer can be like no they have to hit the ground not other stuff yeah plus you could have him like you could have him hit the car and bounce up into the air slightly yeah yeah there's lots of different ways you could do it. or maybe he goes like straight into the side of the van and just is stuck there <laughs> <laughs> you know ultimately i do like that Goku doesn't win the tournament. I think, especially kind of knowing that, and and Toriyama, I think Toriyama also knows at this point that Dragon Ball is going to continue mm-hmm. and plans on it continuing, 
which I don't yeah. know. I don't know that that's true at the end of our next arc or not next arc, but the, the next tournament. But I think kind of knowing that, like leaving that out there is like a carrot for him still kind of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's also important, or I think it's a, it's a good decision to have TN win. I think because it shows like Yamcha and Krillin that no, 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 Goku's absolutely beatable by somebody like them. Because at this point he's been stronger than them for so long that it would almost be kind of reasonable for those characters to go, well, we're never going to catch him. Why would we keep trying? But then TN enters the picture, wins on a technicality, really, but still wins, puts up a good fight. And I think it shows them like, no, 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 it's possible to still keep competing with this guy. He has not become some, you know, super powered being that you're never going to be able to to match. This is also one of the first times that we're going to see a theme that's going to pop up again. I know it happened in the super movie, the superhero Dragon Ball Super superhero movie, and we'll we'll see it like sprinkle in a lot. I, it's kind of going to become like Gohan's sort of defining uh, character trait is like that latent ability does not overcome strategy. Effort. Yeah, because Tien says multiple times throughout this tournament. Anytime I try to take this kid on head on in just a straight like fist fight, mm-hmm. he's stronger than me and he is beating me. I have to come up with different tactics and different strategies. And that's even his his like strategy behind using the Kikoho is mm-hmm. I'm going to destroy the ring and I'll be able to float above it and he can't. Because yeah. I can't beat because if this comes down to like a fist fight, I can't beat him. I like that as a as a theme that keeps going on. Like and it, it's gonna you're gonna see it over and over. And this right. is to me really the first time that we kind of like it's a might does not make right type of thing. Exactly. He's he's got so uh, uh, Toriyama puts some sort of limiting condition on the outcome where it's not just. Oh, you just have to beat this guy in a fist fight. There's some other thing that has to be accomplished while fighting. Right. It's not. It's not. It, this is. This is. This is laying the groundwork for something that you're gonna see a lot in Z. Is like just because your power level isn't as high as that one doesn't mean the outcome of the fight is predetermined. Mm-hmm. Toriyama is has been telling us since the '80s that pure power doesn't matter. <laughs> and we got an excellent example of that uh, in the last tournament with the Jackie Chun match, where the reason why Goku lost had nothing to do with his strength and everything to do with his size. Yeah. And this this gets in more into the strategy of it. Like that's Yes. This is this is that element that's now added to it is it's it's not it's not like a physical thing. It is a, a, a thought thing. It's a, it's I, a thinking. I like to think he also got that from, from the, the action films, the Chinese action films that he was watching, because that's, that is a pretty common theme in a lot of them too, especially like, and this was probably a little bit after Dragon Ball, but this I think exemplifies it like the most is uh, the Jackie Chan mo- or Jackie Chan movies. It's Jackie Chan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Jackie Chan movies where, where like, He'll be having some brawl with like 20 guys, but like his goal is to not beat the 20 guys. It's to like steal back the kid's pillow that was on his wheelchair from these guys or to like not necessarily to beat them with his fists. Right. I mean, and that's a that's a like common theme on a lot of like it, it. It's kind of in Enter the Dragon a little bit where Bruce Lee going into his his final fight has been beaten up, right? He's engaged mm-hmm. in like a ton of fights to this point. Mm-hmm. He is like outmatched because because the the bad guy has like his his knife knife hand mm-hmm. and he winds up like thinking his way around the problem with like all the mirrors that he has to destroy and everything. There is like a lot of that kind of groundwork in a lot of the movies that that Toriyama likes is that just because you're the the strongest doesn't mean you are the winner yeah 
and it's a good strategy. Those movies are good because situations like that increase the drama, and that makes for a much more entertaining product in the end. Right, and this is a really good episode, a really good capper to this saga. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt that this is some of the best animation that's been in the show yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's fantastic, and and I do like you know like you you mentioned like oh I wonder why they're they're you know zeroing in on Krillin, but at the same time like I could I could see again if you don't know what's coming, all of the stuff at the end after this just feeling like filler stuff to pad out the end of the episode before we get into the yeah. the next thing, because we've had yeah. that happen a few times already. The end of the the end of the first tournament in the the manga it basically just ends, and in in the anime there was there was a bit more fluff to it. the The muscle tower stuff had a whole bunch of filler on the back end of it, you know. So you could be watching this and just thinking like, oh, okay, this is the this is what you know. We're gonna just we're gonna we're gonna say our goodbyes here, and then next week we'll. Oh, time for me to half pay attention to the rest of this episode because it's a bunch of fluff that's not gonna matter. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's one of the biggest events in Dragon Ball. Ultimately, yeah. it's introducing. Uh, ultimately, we're going to be introducing one of the series' most well-known and ultimately most beloved characters. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that's the end of this this saga, this arc, this tournament. We have a co- we have like what like five notes, not even on like some of the cover art, just like little things. Yeah. So uh, we at uh, chapter one fifteen has no cover art because Toriyama instead drew an extra page of story. And there's no there's he's never really said, and maybe so, no one has ever really asked him. Did you? Did you just have an extra page of story in you that week? Or did you, like, draw a whole bunch of pages of story and then the deadline came up and you're like, crap, I forgot. I didn't draw a cover this week. <laughs> well, just one more page of story real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could see that happen. He, he has never said, and again, maybe no one has ever asked him. Yeah. Uh, in volume 11, he included an actual picture with him and his son because he said he ran out of time to draw himself as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, for chapter 131, again, no cover art. Yeah, he usually likes to when he has to include himself. And there's a there is actually a moment in my Viz big here where during one of those, I don't know what you call them, like they're normally like either blank pages or or little just goofy drawings and things. They are mm-hmm. what I assume were probably like ad pages originally, but you're not going to keep oh, yeah. an ad page. He's got a whole little little comic almost, and it's about him. It's like It says True Story, and it's called Me Back Then by Akira Toriyama, and it's about him, but he's wearing, and he, he's draw, he drew it, but he's wearing a motorcycle mask the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Because he doesn't like to show his face. He doesn't like people to know what he looks like because he doesn't he's a, want he's a, to be a celebrity. He's a very he's a very famously private person. Yeah, so for him to include a picture of him and his son is, yeah, he must have really ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> this little true story thing, it's it basically says, like, it, it's just a little one-page comic, and it says, like, he had this bike, this motorcycle that looked really nice. And when he would go into coffee shops, people would comment on like, Oh, who's got the really nice looking bike outside. And, but the problem was it didn't always start when he went to start it. And so (laughs) he would sometimes get on it. It wouldn't start. And he would use his foot that was on the opposite side of the window of the shop and push himself along the ground in neutral. (laughs) (laughs) to make it look like he was slowly uh nonchalantly riding away (laughs) 
Yes, that that's perfect. The the awesome entrance and then the not so awesome exit. Perfect. <laughs> so then I have a few I have a few notes on things that I picked up on along the way. One of them that I picked up on because I was very specifically looking for it due to some of the some of the knowing knowing things about like some of the stuff that Toriyama likes to put in the backgrounds of his background characters. So I was Mm -hmm. like, I read through everything and then I actually went back and I will say, I like glanced at like every single panel just very quickly, you know, where this is, this is like 200 some odd pages worth of, of manga. And I went and read through it. And then I went and I like looked through it all in like 200 seconds, you know, like just to glance at the background. I get you. Yeah. (laughs) Because I was looking for interesting background stuff. In chapter 114, it's on the second page of the chapter where you see a a big shot of the preliminary ring with, you can see three and a half full rings. And it's just all background characters, basically. But in the bottom right-hand side of that panel, there is two Zhang Shi with their arms out in front of them and their feet together and they're like levitating above the ground oh. and you can actually see that like they have something plastered over their faces which is you know the seal that makes them behave and knowing that you know he's putting in his riff on a Zhang Shi with Chao Tzu Mm-hmm. He then included a cup like that must have just been in his mind. And he said, let me throw a couple traditional Jiangxi in there for fun. Makes sense. So I noticed, you know, we talked about this in the anime. Launch has a joke in the anime about, hey, every time you're riding a, or in the manga, every time you're in a pl- in the original manga, every time you're riding a plane, don't you just want to hijack it? And then that was removed for the anime. Yeah. Because it was 2000. <laughs> Two, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that joke is left in in the manga to me i thought i wasn't i noticed goku's height change a little bit less in the manga okay maybe i'm just i was just used to it already because we watched the anime and then went back but i feel like when he first kind of shows up in that episode with oh the the green-faced fox, whose name I can't remember anymore. I also cannot remember. <laughs> but when he when he shows up in that episode, I like immediately was like, he looks taller in this episode. And when he shows I, up, yeah, in I the can ma- see that. When he shows up in the manga, I didn't feel that as starkly personally. I think in the manga, it's not so much that his height is different. I think his proportions are slightly different. Okay, yeah. Like, I think he's a little bit taller, but I think it's mostly proportions have been adjusted. I don't know if I don't remember the anime mentioning this explicitly that and the manga does Roshi at one point, like has an inner monologue where he's like, oh, nobody knows that I have been also training in secret in yeah. order to keep up with Goku. I think that was just in the manga. Yeah, I don't. I don't recall that being in the in the anime. And there, there, uh, there was another one that I remembered that was kind of clipped out of the manga, um, in the Krillin Chaozu fight when Krillin goes to fire his Kamehameha. In the anime, he's just straight up like, "Well, I guess I'm going to have to try a Kamehameha, even though I've never done it before." Um, and then in the manga, he actually tries and actually performs like a little baby one the first time he tests it out in the ring before he actually tries the full thing. Yes. Yeah. That was in there, yep. Which I thought I thought added a little bit more characterization for Krillin uh, in the manga, and I, I was a little sad to see that that got cut. But I can I can see from like the animation studio's viewpoint of, well, yeah, but that's like a, a three second scene that we don't necessarily need, and we won't have to animate. <laughs> I don't know how you felt. I thought when when Chaozu is rigging the matchups in the anime, mm-hmm. using his telekinesis, I actually think that came across a little better in the anime. That's one of those moments where I think the anime improved. Yeah. I, and I think mo- it's mostly just like a presentation issue. Like how would you effectively show that without the explicit dialogue in the manga? Right. I, I do like, you know, how they, 
in the anime, they they show like them reaching into the box and the papers are all swirling around. I wonder yeah. if you could have had one panel of that with after Chaozu point, you know, the guy reaching his hand in and seeing the papers all swirling around and that would mm-hmm. kind of get that point across. Yeah, probably. And then like maybe even just a short conversation between him him and Tien prior to that about who they think like they should be matching or who they think should be matched up Mm -hmm. as opposed to doing it like right then and there at the drawing because i was i was reading it and i was going how is nobody hearing them talk about this (laughs) (laughs) because it's not if i remember correctly it's not like thought bubbles so it's like being explicitly said out loud even though we do later learn that they have telekinesis like or yeah telepathy telepathy yeah yeah i don't recall this in the anime but in the manga, Tien muses that, you know, after his fight with Yamcha, he is, hey, I do remember this. He's, like, re- reasonably impressed, you know, that, like, oh, this guy's better than I thought he would be. But he muses to himself that Yamcha, just based on his appearance, is probably the best Kame Senen su- student. Right. And so he's like, if that's the best they have, then Chao Tzu, you and I are going to finish one and two. Yeah. I don't recall that from the anime. Uh, I think it was explicitly st- said in the anime. Okay. The Roshi versus Tien matchup, I just felt like I noticed I picked up a lot more on the explicitly Roshi saying things like, come to the light, stay out of the shadows, enter the <laughs> yeah. sun, get out of the dark. I picked up on that a lot more. Again, we keyed in on that at the beginning of talking about this, but I noticed it in the dialogue a lot more. Yeah, definitely. I'll agree in, with that. In the manga. Oh, there's a there's a moment, and this is in the, the anime and the manga, but there's a, in the in the manga, there's a moment where Jackie, or not Jackie Chun, where Master Roshi shows up backstage to watch Goku versus Tien with Krillin. Mm-hmm. And Krillin is like, you're not allowed back here. And... Roshi's like, yeah, don't worry about it. In the manga, he says, drop the dime. Nobody's going to notice. Now, I from the context of it, I kind of was picking up what he was putting down. But so I went and like looked up what drop the dime means. Okay. And it means actually to like when you drop a dime on someone, you're you're like snitching on them. And so. Oh, okay. I think it's essentially Roshi saying, like, call someone who cares type of, you know, like, like, oh, like, uh, drop the dime in like the payphone. Yeah. And then one thing I was a little bit surprised to see is an anime exclusive. Just, just cause it, it seems like it would like, this is one of those things that kind of like your thing with, with Krillin testing out his Kamehameha. Mm-hmm. This is a moment that endears me to Tien really well. And I think endears the audience to him to him really well, where he's like, oh, it's not fair that I hit you while Chao Tzu was making you have stomach cramps. So I'm going to yeah. give you a free shot on me. That is anime only. And I was just a little surprised. Like, I really like that moment. Because it's really exemplifying what it is that Roshi saw in him to begin with. Right. And we're getting that glimpse of his real character. Right. The other, the other, the only other big thing, because like there's lots of filler, right? Like all the stuff with with Master Chen, uh, or Crane Crane Senen trying to murder Goku in his sleep <laughs> is filler. And I was disappointed that wasn't in the manga actually. And what I was what I was like almost a little surprised is no break. Like there's no breaks. Yeah, it's it's pretty much like we're going to get through this tournament as fast as we can appears in the manga to all happen in a day when you like there's no there's never a break the announcer even asks goku after he defeats krillin hey do you want a break because you know the finale is next and he's like no i'm good (laughs) (laughs) and poor krillin i was just like i was just surprised that there's no breaks because the one the one break i was expecting was actually between the semifinals and the finals and having that that one moment of Goku like stretching 
in Roshi's hotel room before the match. Yeah. And Tien meditating when he's in the yeah, anime. He's, and he's like, he's so floating. Just he's, yeah, floating and there's like a weird aura coming off of him. Yeah. I was expecting that to be in the manga. Just because it hypes you up for that match a little bit. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I could see that. And and so that wasn't in there. And that was that was surprising. Like that it all just, it like is blisteringly fast paced. Yes, absolutely. That really all puts a bow on this saga. I came into it remembering that I liked it, but not remembering anything about it, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Other than like I knew I knew who like won each match and things like that, but I just I didn't remember a lot of the particulars. Yeah. And like I had completely forgotten the volleyball attack thing. <laughs> it was so out of left field. <laughs> like it doesn't match the tone of anything. It's just it's one of those moments where Toriyama's like desire to have something that's like fun and bright versus being like always serious just <laughs> worms its way in. And I I do like that he does stuff like that. I like when he will and cuz he I think he knows the right times to do it to mm-hmm. undercut the seriousness and the constantly ratcheting tension with just a little bit of humor. Yeah, absolutely. And he he just gets better as he goes along, honestly. Yeah. I think it's really great because like especially like given recent events like we were talking before the episode, just how kind of zany real life can be from time to time. He he times it well, but then at the same time, like I, I can believe that like in a world where like dudes yell at each other and it changes their hair color that like ridiculous stuff like this is the norm yeah that's that's actually like a really good point too is you know i'm not gonna i I don't want to say anything specific and root us to a to a spot in time but yes you will see in real time you will see people turn serious serious things into memes yeah, yeah, Gallo's humor is a real thing, folks. And so I like that that's mixed into Dragon Ball. Yeah, I think it makes it realistic. I came into this not remembering a ton about it, and now I do. I have like a deeper appreciation for everything that's happening in it as it's going on. I do think there's a little bit as as someone who's kind of experienced obviously all of Dragon Ball to to this point. There's a little bit of lessened impact of like the is he isn't he good stuff with TN, but it's hard to fault the storytelling that because it works in the story the way it's told. Yeah, absolutely. I for me, I remember I remembered a lot about this storyline. It's probably one of my it's probably number two just after the next tournament. And like that's one and two for storylines for all for all of the Dragon Ball portion for me. But it was interesting coming back to this, having not read it and not seen it for a fair amount of years, coming back to this as as a uh, definitely a fully grown adult. It gave me more appreciation, though, for the character growth that is displayed. And I don't just mean like the fighters becoming stronger. I mean, like their their characters are are changing they're growing they're becoming the characters that we know they're going to be in the future and it's it's refreshing to go back and see this and see where that started from and to know that oh yeah no this is actually going to take off and we're going to get some really good stuff out of this as far as like krillin yamcha and i feel the older you get if you come back to this storyline the more that's going to resonate with you as a person because there's definitely been a lot of instances now as my family has grown you know i have tons of nieces and nephews getting to to watch and see those first little sprouts developing of who they're going to be for the rest of their lives i i get what you're saying like as a as a parent but yeah that's i i you know i'm sure we'll we will probably say this uh, at least two more times (laughs) as as we've still got two more major arcs in the Dragon Ball portion of the story to go. But it is like I 
It's been a very long time since I have revisited the Dragon Ball portion of Dragon Ball. Mm -hmm. And it has been awesome, really, as we've done this podcast, to go back and look at this stuff and look at it with a more... Yes, a more critical eye and a more adult eye and, and that, you know, that storytelling piece of it, but yeah. also a more more knowledgeable eye as we've been digging into the, you know, the reasons why things are the way they are and and sort of see so many things that are for for a for a for a storyteller like Toriyama, who I do genuinely believe makes this up as he goes along <laughs> doesn't have it planned out how much stuff he sprinkles in throughout these early goings that end up blooming and blossoming into more defined character traits that we think of when we think of those characters yeah today it's not always easy to to manage all that stuff especially you know I would imagine it's even harder when you're writing this 15 pages at a time, one week at a time for years. Yeah, you'd almost say it's it's pretty easy for a writer to get lost in the weeds that way. Yeah. But so, I don't know, that's that's kind of my bow on this tournament. I think it's I do think it's really good. Where I where I rank it is tough cuz I really like that first tournament a lot. The first tournament's very good. Yeah. W what would you give this out of seven Dragon Balls? This arc, I, I would give... Uh, it's going to vary a little bit, I guess, depending on my mood of the day, but somewhere between six and seven stars on this one. It's just a masterpiece. I kind of want to do the... In the manga, I think it's a seven... In the anime, I think it's a six, and I think that's just due to this, the inconsistencies at times of the animation mm -hmm. and the inconsistencies, inconsistencies at time of the times of the pacing. Yes, exactly. And I was also going to mention the, the art as well, like you did. There's, there's uh, probably the biggest jumps in quality up and down in this tournament, but the highs are much higher than anything that we've seen yet. Mm-hmm. So, was it good for you? That's what she said. She who? No, it... It's... <sighs> Do they not have that's what she said on your planet? If it doesn't conflict with anything I've said in our pre previous 40 plus episodes, then no, we do not. Hmm. I admit I'm having difficulty keeping track of any potential logical fallacies and plot holes in our various adventures, but I think the important thing is that we all have fun and learn some new things along the way. That's what this has all been about. From my point of view, it's been about torturing, maiming, and killing me. And glorifying your ego. No small task, either. And yet you keep finding new ways. Anyway, you didn't really answer my question. W was my summary of our adventures since we last broadcast adequate? Frankly, I'm quite sure it wasn't, but while we are rushing towards that uncharted, unnamed planet, I will need at least one more episode to really set the stage so we can call it here for today. Huh. That seemed awfully fast. What are you implying? Nothing. Nothing. Just commenting on the episode being a little shorter than usual. They can't all be marathons running through the entire Halo franchise. Mm, touche. Besides, I need to get into the right state of mind to set the stage next time. Can we just sign off now? Can we just sign off now? Will we have ourselves collected and ready to confront the five warriors gathered on that unnamed planet? Find out next time and help us achieve our final forum. Final Form is written and produced by Tom Gwelly. It is performed by Dan Kinney and Tom Gwelly. Our webmaster is Dan Kinney. Our theme music is provided by YouTube content creator GVG Kit. 
Want to learn more about the Dragon Ball universe, including concept art, behind-the-scenes interviews, and recommendations from Jelly and Bikini? Connect with us on social media. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Final Forum Pod. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you receive your podcasts. And of course, make sure to share it with your friends and family and help us spread the word of the glory of Lord Frieza. The Frieza Force thanks you for your listenership.